Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. Today I'll be talking to Thomas Carruthers about his area of expertise, political polarization and democracy. We'll talk about the extremely polarized U.S. situation and what the psychological and social factors are behind that. And we talk a bit about polarization in other places in the world. This interview was done on November 12th, 2020. A little bit about Thomas Carruthers. He's Senior Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a leading authority on international support for democracy, human rights, governance, the rule of law, and civil society. He's worked on democracy assistance projects for many organizations and carried out extensive field research on aid efforts around the world. He's the author or editor of 10 books and many articles, including a recent book of his that I read called Democracy Divided, The Global Challenge of Political Polarization. That book examines cases of political polarization from across the world, including the United States. Okay, here's the interview with Thomas Carruthers. Thanks for coming on, Mr. Carruthers. Good to be with you. Yes, let's start with a basic question. You can see many experts say things like democracy is in decline around the world or democracy is eroding. What specifically do they mean when they say things like that? I think they mean a couple of different things. They mean, first of all, that citizens in a lot of democracies are really fed up with the politicians and the political parties that they have. There's a lot of alienation out there and therefore a lot of voting for people who are kind of outside the system. Often we call them populists. Many of them do have a populist orientation, but sometimes it's just outside the box candidates. So in the first case, citizen alienation. Second, we also see a number of leaders really breaking the rules, manipulating elections, cracking down in soft and sometimes not so soft ways against independent voices, um, overriding checks and balances. So we see a lot of kind of growing authoritarianism out there. So citizen alienation, growing authoritarianism. And then third, I guess, a lot of the kind of really big authoritarian regimes, above all Russia and China, are doing better than people expected. And China is not liberalizing, even though it's growing a lot. Russia is back on its feet as an authoritarian power. So the combination of these kinds of things are what's leading to a general sense of, hey, democracy is just really not doing very well in the world. So I was watching a video from 2015. It was a discussion panel that you were in. And there were some people that criticized the idea that democracy was actually in decline. Are there valid counterpoints that the problem may be a bit exaggerated or overstated? And and has that view changed in the last five years? Five years ago, some people were holding out and saying it's really more of a plateau that's occurring in the world, a slowing of democracy's growth. But the last five years have been pretty punishing. And most people now, you know, use the term democratic recession and don't get much pushback. Now, those who have tried to argue for a slightly rosier picture do point to some things that are worth keeping in mind. Um, First of all, they note that even in places that are under a lot of stress, which unfortunately includes the United States, um, democracy has not collapsed. And so in Europe and North America and the sort of wealthy established democracies, they've been under pressures, but they have not fallen apart. Secondly, a lot of the countries where democracy is really struggling, think about Brazil or think about India, are countries where we didn't think that democracy was necessarily going to do that well, or we thought it was you know, sort of always in question because of the conditions in the country, the, the poverty or the lack of tradition of democracy or this or that. So people would say, yeah, sure, democracy is under stress in a lot of places, but that isn't that surprising. And then third that was causing some people to push back was, and here's a puzzle, civic activism, independent voices and actors going out and pushing for things in the public interest. Civic activism is actually burgeoning in a lot of countries. We see it in all the protests that are occurring in the world. Maybe we can come back to this later. And so even as leaders are often failing their people and citizens are frustrated, citizen activism is in some ways flourishing in a number of places. So it isn't like just a one-sided dark picture. As always, it's complex and there are positive notes. But overall, democratic recession, unfortunately, does describe the world these days. So if you had to give your professional opinion on what is behind a lot of these dynamics? Is it something 
that's happening due to technological changes? Is it something that's a fundamental kind of backlash that tends to happen towards modern liberal societies? What what would you summarize as the uh, dynamics? Yeah, it's really hard to point to any single cause or one or two causes, but let me touch on a couple of things. First, in the wealthy established democracies, in the last 20 years has seen a lot of economic stagnation for the middle class. We know this in the United States. Wages just haven't been going up. A lot of dislocation, a lot of insecurity. And trying to maintain democracy when you have a population that's not doing that well economically, even if you have growth, but you're having rising inequality and, like say, a lot of stagnation in the middle class, that causes a lot of angst among citizens, a lot of searching for alternatives, unfortunately, undemocratic alternatives. So one problem is just what's really a historic shift of economic success from the West to Asia. The West is still very wealthy and still successful in some ways, but the last 20 years have seen huge economic growth in Asia and not in the West. So that's one big thing. Second big thing is you described sort of cultural issues is there was a lot of change over the last 20 or 30 years in what many people would call a progressive direction. Uh, More rights for LGBTQ, more rights for women, more immigration, sort of opening up societies to foreign influences and so forth. And as I say, five years ago or so, there really arose a fairly strong pushback against that, the kind of sociocultural wave of conservatism. We see it in Poland with the the right-wing party there that's um, driving illiberalism in Poland. We see it in the United States in the last five years. The culture war is really amping up over a lot of issues related to how far is progressivism going to go. And we see it in a number of European countries as well, like Hungary and uh, elsewhere. And so this cultural pushback against a progressive agenda combined with the economic angst and frustrations of a lot of people in the working and middle class has pushed back hard, has led to citizens choosing leaders who push back hard against traditional liberal democratic norms. So it seems like we often assume that people, most people want democracy, but it seems like you can make the argument that many people simply don't want, actually want democracies, that many people find it threatening, psychologically threatening to have to consider and respect other people's points of view. Do you think that's an accurate observation to make that that many people actually don't want democracy? Well, I think it's hard to generalize in that way. You know, what do people want? They want security. They they want a you know a decent life. They want a secure life, a decent life, and then they want freedom. They don't want somebody coming and whacking them over the head for saying what they think, and they want a political system that delivers those things. Now they're willing to sacrifice uh, various things if they're not getting everything they want, and unfortunately, as political struggles have 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 ratcheted up in recent years in a number of places between contending forces. Some people feel like, you know what, if we need to sort of squelch the views of these other people or, you know, press against traditional democratic norms, like this free press is really irritating. Uh, I don't respect the views that it has. And so if I see a leader trashing the free press, yeah, I'm for that. And so when people are angry and disappointed in their political system, they begin then to grasp at illiberal ideas driven by leaders who want to use those ideas to consolidate their power. So I tend not to say, you know, does this citizen want democracy or not? I don't think most citizens think in that way. They think about the life they have and the life they'd like to have, whether or not the political system is giving it to them. And if it's not, what are they willing to do? Who are they willing to vote for? Or what other things are they willing to do to try to change their life? And so I think what we've really been seeing is a lot of churning, sort of socio-political churning in societies of people who are restless, dissatisfied, looking for something different, and sometimes going down the road of being intolerant and um, being willing to step on the freedoms of others for the sake of trying to get what they want. Yeah. Have you read Fukuyama's book, Identity, his recent book? Yes, I have. I thought he made some really good points in there about the group identity uh, dynamics that lead to people basically pushing back against having to consider other people's points of view in the sense that it's psychologically threatening to have to consider all these different Mm -hmm. narratives and people long for a return to a perceived simpler, you know, better time, even if it's 
kind of an illusion. Uh, I thought he made some really good points in there about tying together a lot of mm-hmm. these different movements, especially a lot of the more right wing movements and the drive towards authoritarianism. And some of your um, work, I think, ties into those kind of ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, no, it's a very good book. And I recommend it to people, The Rise of Identity Politics. I mean, I think it's important to keep your eye on grievance. People cling harder to exclusive identities, identities that really are intolerant towards others when they're fueled by a sense of grievance. And they're fueled by a sense of, I'm not getting my share, or these other people are cutting in front of me in the line. And my people who look like this or talk like this or believe this particular religion or whatever it happens to be are getting pushed aside by others. And therefore, I don't want to be tolerant towards others. I want what's mine. And so intolerance isn't just a free-floating idea. It's an idea that comes out of grievance and unhappiness in a sense that uh, it's a zero-sum game society. And so as societies are struggling to give people what they want in their lives, this zero-sum mindset has definitely been increasing. So I used to have a view, and maybe you can tell me if this was a very naive view. I used to think that a a civil war type scenario or, or major unrest in a country would only come about if a large percentage of people in the country were doing badly economically or a large percentage of people weren't, weren't able to eat regularly. But is that a naive view? Because reading Fukuyama's book kind of opened me up to the idea that it was more about how people were doing relatively and perceived grievances and not so much about economics. Yeah, I'm afraid he's right. Um, you know, the American Civil War although it had economic roots in the sense of the contending systems in the South and the North of agriculture and rising industry and so forth, it was more of a social war than an economic war. You know, it was sort of two different visions of America, two different visions of how people should be allowed to organize their own communities and states and so forth. And a lot of civil wars are group identity wars. You know, um, there's often a grievance which might be fueled by economic conditions of one group feeling disadvantaged relative to another. But, you know, the Tutsis and Hutus in Rwanda wasn't really an economic war. It was for various reasons the identity between those two groups was aggravated and mobilized by politicians who were using it to sort of leverage themselves into power or to wield power over others. And so I think this, there's a little bit of an American tendency sometimes to think that economics drives you know, um, human behavior in many ways, where it's, I think we should appreciate how powerful the you know, the identity drivers of conflict are. Is it fair to say that things will usually be kicked off to a to a much worse level by economic things? For example, in the U.S., you know, it's it seems like a lot of the worst case scenarios have been made more likely by COVID and the financial impacts from that. Is it is it fair to say that it, it can play a big role or it usually plays a big role in, in nations going downhill? Well, if the pie is shrinking, more likely you're going to fight over that pie. It's just less of it to go around, and so people are going to go after it. But when we look at the clashes, you know, this in the United States this year, say in Portland, between people protesting for racial justice and people uh, striking back against those protesters because they have a different set of beliefs, uh, people on the far right, you could say that's economically rooted in some ways, and that the search for racial justice is also a search for economic justice. But it's not just that. It's a search for dignity. It's a search for equal treatment in all kinds of ways, not just economic. And the pushback against it isn't per se economic either. It's an identity clash. And it's a view of, you know, clashing views of how society should be organized and what justice means for different groups. And so COVID has put a lot of societies under stress in different ways. But I don't think we should believe that it's really, there's an economic driver always of conflict. I think there are just many other causes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess if I had to make the connection there, it's it's hard for me to imagine the George Floyd protests and unrest getting to that level without the destabilizing both uh, psychologically and financially effects of COVID. Yeah, you know, there were pretty big protests over racial justice in our past, Um, you know, several years ago with the the cases that that emerged of uh, police violence against African-Americans. And that wasn't at a time of, per se, of, you know, great economic hardship for the country. 
So, you know, the racial justice issue in this country flares up at times. Yeah, it just seems a bit a bit bigger. Like, I mean, I live in Portland and it's hard for me to imagine these things happening. What's been happening in Portland, it's hard for me to imagine it, it happening a year ago. But obviously, that's, you know, the, these are opinion questions. Let's talk a little bit about your Democracies Divided book. I know you wrote the, the U.S. chapter in that. How difficult is it to attempt to summarize such complicated situations? I know you've spent a long time researching that area, but it must be a continually moving target. Was it difficult to try to summarize the polarization issues and the issues in the U.S.? Well, look, trying to tell the story of polarization of the United States of the last 50 or 60 years in, you know, 15 or 20 pages, <laughs> of course, it's a challenge. But uh, on the other hand, trying to boil it down to the essence is useful because you can also get lost in the details. I was just reading Rick Perlstein's. He has this tremendous four-volume series on the sort of the history of modern American conservatism. It's a, it's a tremendous accomplishment. But you're into 700 to 1,000 pages per volume, and there are times where you feel like you're you're drowning, you know, in details. So what I was trying to do there in that chapter was to say, you know, what is the essential divide in the United States? When did it emerge? What has been driving it? And what are some of the consequences of it? And, you know, I think that is a possible task. doesn't mean everyone's going to agree with you. Polarization is a polarizing topic. <laughs> right. And when you try to give an account of polarization, you can be sure that some people can say, that's not how I see it. Uh, so I was aware of that. And I was trying to be, you know, as balanced as I could or trying to see it through not a partisan lens. But inevitably, people in a divi divided society are going to have very divided opinions about why it's divided. This might be a good segue. Uh, you know, we hear a lot in the mainstream about Trump and the GOP uh divisiveness in terms of their points of view and, and actions driving the divide. And Trump is clearly a divisive and abnormal figure in ways that the U.S. has never seen before in a president. But many conservatives have the point of view that Obama was very divisive. They point to things like his use of executive orders or the fact that Obama talked about racial justice issues and, in their opinion, that fanned the flames of the racial divide. And I confess, I don't see anything that divisive or polarizing about Obama I've tried to see those points of view, and I've been pretty perplexed by that point of view, because Obama just seemed to me like a pretty traditional president doing normal things. But I wonder if you see valid points in that. Are, are there things about Obama that can be more objectively seen as divisive or abnormal in your point of view? Well, look, you know, when uh, Barack Obama assumed the presidency, uh, he, before he had you know, lifted his little finger to do anything, he'd come under systematic attack for not being a real American. Maybe he's really a Muslim. He wasn't really born in the United States. He shouldn't be president. The birther movement wasn't a response to him being divisive. It was an attack on his legitimacy by a political party that was having trouble accepting the fact that they'd lost an election and there was somebody who was president whose views they disagreed with. And, you know, from the first day of his presidency on, there was, you know, a fairly full scale assault on his credibility and legitimacy uh, fueled by a you know hyperpartisan media on the conservative side that went after him by people who sort of pursued the birther narrative like Donald Trump and others and by the Senate which as Mitch McConnell you know said behind the scenes was dedicated from day one to weakening and hopefully in their view stopping his presidency at the end of four years so the idea that sort of somehow he governed in such a way to produce a polarizing sort of context or a, a response is, I don't think, borne out by the facts. And the idea that something he did on racial justice somehow fanned those flames, come on, we've been having a fight over racial justice in this country for quite a long time, more than 100 years, more than 150 years. And President Obama approached those issues very gingerly, and very hesitantly, to the point that many in the progressive community, I think, felt he was underplaying them and should have done more. And so I think it would be hard to say the fact, of course, he should speak about racial justice. So did Lyndon Baines Johnson. So did President Kennedy. So did a lot of presidents. Presidents need to do that when the issue's on the boil. And I think President Obama, when you look back at the speeches on it, they were thoughtful. They were historically informed. They were moderate in their intentions and in their planned actions. And so arguing that somehow the fact that he talked about racial justice was stirred people up just isn't borne out by the facts. 
it's been perplexing to me because I've gone out of my way to try to understand those points of view. And when people bring that up as a major criticism of Obama, they point to things and I'm like, that's a completely normal thing for him to have said, or, you know, he, and he only really talked about it like a couple of times. It wasn't like he was constantly talking about it. So it's yeah. a, when people point to that as like the major aspect or something, it's hard to understand. Yeah. Let's talk about the executive order. So another big charge as well, he governed in a, you know, kind of authoritarian fashion by issuing executive order. First of all, every person is his executive orders. That's what they're there for, is for presidents to issue executive orders on issues that are appropriate to that power. And since he faced a Republican-controlled Congress for parts of his presidency that was determined to stop him in his tracks and made no bones about that fact, using executive order was a fairly natural response to that. Uh, if he'd gotten some cooperation, a willingness to meet him halfway on some major initiatives like health care reform, then he wouldn't have had to resort to executive measures. And so when you have political gridlock, uh, partisan gridlock like we do in our legislative system, executive orders are used a lot. President Trump has been using executive orders a lot, too. And so it's a, the use of executive orders is a consequence of polarization, not a cause of it. So reading the Democracy's Divided book, I was struck by how much religion seems to play a role in a lot of divides, which maybe is a common sense observation. But do you think it's accurate to say that religion plays a big role in these divides? Or, or do you think it's possible or likely that, that even in a completely secular world, we'd still have various fights about traditions and, and in-group versus out-group fights? Well, when we, the team of researchers uh, and I, we looked at polarization in a number of different democracies around the world, Kenya. Brazil, Colombia, uh, India, Indonesia, the United States, Poland, etc. We did find that um, there are a variety of bases on which people divide when they they divide harshly in a kind of binary way. One of them is ethnicity, like in Kenya with two different tribes that you know, can't get along very well. Sometimes it's ideology, like in Venezuela, where you have a left of center or a leftist view embodied in Hugo Chavez and uh, an opposing view to that, and it becomes just a paralyzing divide in the country. But sometimes it's not ethnicity or ideology, it's religion. And it's usually not two different religions, but rather a rather fundamentalist view of the role of religion in society versus a more secular view. So in Turkey, for example, which is unfortunately a very divided country now, um, the ruling party is of the more Islamist kind of perspective in terms of how society should be run. And there's a sort of secular part of Turkey or side of Turkey, if you will, that disagrees with that. Or in India, there's a Hindu nationalist sort of movement and embodied in the ruling party. And there are people who have a more secular view of India. And so religion is another identity form of identity affiliation that can be very divisive. And it's not any particular religion. It's, you know, uh, Hindu nationalism in India. In Poland, it's uh, conservative Catholicism versus a more secular view. In Israel, it's more orthodox Judaism versus a more secular view. In Turkey, it's Islam. And so it isn't something about a particular religion. It's that religion is another form of identity affiliation that has become very divisive in a number of countries. Would a religion-free world, I'm not sure if that's really imaginable, be less divided? No, I think humans would find plenty of other things to divide along. So I think the question is, in a way, why have all these different divisions been escalating in, in recent years? Why is it that societies are, so many democracies are in fundamental identity struggles? Why is it that that's emerged? Now, that's a puzzle. It seems like a lot of the divisions in countries that I've read about are related to Islam in one way or another, whether it's Islamic groups seeking power or other groups being scared of Islam and reacting in authoritarian ways to suppress it. Some obvious examples are Turkey and India, but even in cases like the US, there are a lot of Muslim-related fears and anxieties amongst conservatives. I've talked to some conservatives who name their fears of Islam taking over the US as the main reason they support Trump. Am I perceiving that correctly, that Islam and reactions to Islam, you know, over even overreactions to Islam, are those having major impacts on polarization in various ways? 
Well, as I mentioned, societies with very different religions are experiencing religion as a polarizing force in socio-political, socio-cultural life. But it is occurring in a number of Muslim-majority societies. I mean, I think it's it's inarguable that in the last 50 years or so, there's still a major working out in many Muslim-majority countries of the role that Islam should play in both everyday life, but in political life, and that that's an evolving issue. And there's been a lot of change in places. A lot of places have become, uh, Islam has occupied a much bigger role in sociopolitical life than it used to, in some places less. And so it's in a way, it's a topic that's really alive in Muslim majority countries, in a way that in many Christian countries, for example, that got fought over a lot historically, but in some ways is less of an issue, but still quite present in places like Poland or Hungary, where the leadership is a very divisive leadership and makes appeals to conservative Catholicism or a conservative approach to religion. And it's very divisive in the United States. We see it over abortion, which is related to debates over religious values and other elements of religion that, that play out in American life. So I, certainly nothing particular to Islam, but it is true that, that Islam is at a state of its own historical evolution, like I say, where it's a very live topic in many Muslim-majority countries of what role Islam should play in daily life. Now, you mentioned radicalism, terrorism. The fact that there have been currents of, you know, sort of radical Islamist thinking and then action on violent action using Islam or radical Islam as a kind of basis for that action, of course, has turned up the temperature for many people of their views about Islam. And so a number of people, uh, particularly outside Muslim majority countries who are not very familiar with, with Islam, see these currents. And of course, they're hit by terrorism in different ways in their societies. And they generalize from that to this sort of general fear of Islam as a religion and the fear of Muslims in their own society. I don't think it's warranted, but it's something that's clearly happened as a result of these, these you know, actions that have occurred. So one thing that's been very perplexing to me about a lot of these polarization issues is how evenly split populations often are. So the U.S. is a good example with how close the 2016 election was, and now 2020, how close that was. And then, for example, in Turkey, Erdogan got like 52% of the vote when he was first voted in, I think. So it just seems very weird and kind of mysterious to me that populations can be so evenly split when you consider how varied and chaotic the issues seem to be and how strange some of the leaders like Trump seem to be and how quickly things can change in terms of public opinion. Do you agree that that's kind of weird how close, for example, the U.S. election is, or am I missing something obvious that helps explain why such things are consistently close? Well, I think it's a little bit your sampling approach, Zach, is you're, there are a lot of places where it's not so close. So like mm-hmm. India, Hindu nationalism versus the more secular view hasn't been a 50-50 split. In recent years, Hindu nationalists have had a preponderance of support and a power. Or, for example, in, uh, I would say, Hungary, it's not quite so evenly split. The government, which has been very polarizing there, gained kind of majority control through doing quite well in some elections. And so it hasn't really been 50-50. And so you're kind of choosing cases that happen to come out that way, but I don't think that's a condition. Or look at Germany, for example, which is experiencing much greater divisions over the kind of radical right, the alternative for, for Deutschland, the radical right party. But it's more of a 90-10 or 85-15 split in the country. So now, turning to the U.S., uh, we've just been through a number of pretty close elections in the last 20 years. Not all of them, but some of them have been really close. There, I think it's partly the fact that uh, you know we have a very binary system. There's no other choice except the two parties, and the two parties fight head to head, and there has been a kind of a tendency to energize the base, particularly on the right, but energize the base and then fight towards the center. And so in a sense, there's almost a natural convergence over this group of people in the sort of 10 to 15 percent in the middle who are less committed partisan to one side or the other. And when you push towards the center like that, you kind of somehow end up 
with these very close elections as a result. So, but it's not necessarily a natural condition of polarized countries. I think it's just one that we're living through. And so I wouldn't overgeneralize from our experience. Yeah, I guess the weird thing about the U.S. situation seems to me that with all the crazy things that have happened in the last four years, that we would still be so evenly split. But I guess it points to the idea that once you establish those divisions, that it's very hard to shift people away, you know? So basically it's almost like it almost doesn't matter in a lot of ways, like the events or the, uh, the, mm-hmm. the, the strange behavior of Trump or something. And we, we've just remained split in those ways. And I guess that's the surprising thing to me, because I would have expected more, you know, even like state by state variety and, and more uh, compared mm-hmm. to past elections. But I guess it points to like the sol- solidity of these groupings once we get into them. Yeah, but we have many states, you know, half the states in the United States are not evenly split. You have California going, you know, 66% one way, and you have Utah going 66% or so in the other way. And so the states, even with the states that are different, they're, they were mostly still aligning with past divisions, I guess was mm-hmm. my point. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. 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 No, no, I think that's true. A lot of the uh, national divisions seem to be related to the structure of the governments. And you write about this for the U.S. and how the U.S. has a certain government structure and election structure that lends itself to being gridlocked and unable to function in a very polarized environment. Can you talk a little bit about what those government structures are that lend themselves to being gridlocked Mm -hmm. in that way? Well, first and foremost, we have a two-party system. Because of the way our electoral system is, it's very hard for small parties to thrive. And as a result, you've got to either choose this or that. And countries that have multi-party systems, proportional representation, and so they end up with three, four, five, six, seven parties, don't tend to have these A versus B kind of uh, divisions in the political life quite as starkly as the United States does. Um, So one thing is that you know, our two-party system, you know, is a thought experiment. Imagine we had proportional representation in the United States. Um, It's not hard to imagine that we'd have four parties. We'd have a left progressive party, kind of moderate uh, center-left party. You'd have a pro-business, center-right, pro-trade, pro-immigration party. And then you'd have a further to the right, more nationalist kind of Trump-like party. And people would have a greater sense of choice, and there'd be some fluidity then in terms of what coalitions would govern. Should it be the two centrist parties? Should it be the two right parties, the two left parties, et cetera? So one is our party system or our electoral system that produces our party system. The second is the way our Congress works, which is a system that was set up, particularly the Senate, um, to operate on, uh, on the basis of a lot of informal rules of cooperation and a lot of uh, sort of supermajoritarian features that were designed to make it a consensual body, which when the polarization sets into the political system produces gridlock because you can't get the kind of majorities you need to, to pass legislation. And so it's a body that works well when the parties are getting along well and are able to reach consensus fairly easily, but it's a system that breaks down in terms of legislative productivity once you have a polarized kind of system. There are other features. The willingness to fiddle with electoral, the fact that we set uh, electoral districts through state legislatures rather than independent commissions or some kind of form of neutrality and setting, you know, districting um, has led to a lot of gerrymandering that just feeds polarization because then if you have districts which are stacked one way or the other way, you tend to have then candidates and then representatives who will lean far one direction or far in the other direction. And uh, in other countries, uh, districting wouldn't be up for political grabs in the same way. So that's a, uh, another feature. And then finally, our political financing. The fact that we have such sort of open door to uh, political financing, you know, uh, if uh, Bloomberg wants to give $100 million to try to influence the outcome in Florida, he's perfectly able to do that. It's a lot of money, as did a lot of other super wealthy people in the country in this election and past elections. And it's generally the case that, you know, the super wealthy who give large amounts of money for political action committees and other forms of trying to influence elections Those who give a lot of money are often those who are most partisan, and money, floods of money, tend to drive a system 
towards greater and greater sort of extreme partisanship. You know, there's, it's rare that you have a centrist who's really determined to commit their fortune for a centrist goal. People are usually determined to commit their fortune for a goal to the left or to the, to the right. And so our liberality with respect to political financing, I guess to use a sort of polite term for it, also increases the polarization of the system because it allows very polarizing actors to have a very big role. And uh, is election, I think you mentioned the election cycles being off kilter as being a factor there too? Well, I don't think that's so much a factor. I mean, we do have the oddity of the fact that the Senate is not all chosen at once. It's on a rolling basis, but I don't think that per se contributes to polarization. And then the fact that the House is, comes up for election so often, which is quite unusual in comparative terms to have only two-year terms for House members. Uh, it does put them on a permanent electoral footing because they finish one election and they've got to start thinking the next day about the next mm -hmm. election. So we do have a, a lot of elections in that sense. But I don't think uh, that would make a big difference if it were lined up differently. Yeah, I guess it was pointing to increasing gridlock, not necessarily increasing uh, polarization. I mean, another factor that's unusual in the U.S. system is that does contribute to polarization is is primaries for choosing candidates. Um, it seems like kind of an obvious thing. We've all gotten used to it, but it's actually relatively unusual to choose candidates through primaries in this way. And the primaries have really been driving partisanship in the parties. When people sit to talk about somebody getting primaried now, it means kind of a polarizing thunderbolt uh, against that person for having strayed towards the center, particularly in the Republican Party, if a Republican makes any move towards the center, the further right forces say, we're going to primary this person and knock them down in a primary election. And these primary elections produce candidates who are to the sides rather than towards the center. And I think that's um, troubling. In the U.S. case, or maybe in other cases, is gridlock always a bad thing? Because it it seems to be possible to imagine a world in which one side did actually have the ability to make big changes quickly. And you can imagine that theoretically leading to even greater backlash from the other side. So I'm wondering if there can be positive aspects of not being able to regulate that quickly. Well, you know, I remember I was in uh, Great Britain in uh, 19, late 1978, early 1979, when Margaret Thatcher was elected. I remember she got elected, you know, on a, whatever day of the week it was, a Sunday. And Friday that week, her new parliament passed a new tax code. And I remember as an American thinking, what? A new tax code in five days? You know, A, we never get a new tax code in this country. We never come to agreement. We, any kind of tax reform, you know, which is usually very partial, takes a long time. And I thought, is that, is that okay to just put a new tax code in? And then within three months, she, you know, privatized this, banking that, um, did this to the railways and so forth. And I must say that, you know, there's something to be said for when somebody wins an election, allowing to, them to carry out their agenda and see how you like it, and then make a choice in the next election based on they had a full run of the of the game and they made these changes and it seems to have had these effects. Continual gridlock mostly produces citizen angst and uh, alienation over time because the government can't seem to get anything done. And so I, I'm not such a fan of gridlock as that somehow this is a noble American attempt to make sure the government you know, never really does anything. Our country needs reforms, whether they're from the left or from the right. Um, we desperately need to inject new ideas and new energy into our governance because a lot of things aren't being governed very well in this country. Yeah, that's a good point about an increasing the anti-government uh, sentiment, which seems to be very common on, on, on both sides, you know, just feeling like the, these people aren't doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the founding fathers of the U.S. would have had a hard time imagining such a divided population with such different realities that they inhabit? Or do you think those kind of dynamics were well understood at the time that they were trying to create a government? Well, they wouldn't have understood some of the current manifestations, but the founding fathers had a healthy appreciation of the dangers of, of human beings as political animals, uh, their tendency to form into tribal-like groups, if you will, and conflict with each other. 
And so some of the founding fathers weren't that keen on political parties, for example, which they felt would be dangerous. They were already quite aware of the division over states' rights versus a stronger federal government, which re remains, you know, more than 200 years later, one of the fundamental cleavages in our country. So I, I think they had a healthy appreciation of the power of divisiveness and the need to create institutions that could withstand a very divided political life. Yeah, I already respect the the work they did a lot, but if we uh, survive relatively in the tech, the, the next few years, I'll, I'll have even more respect for uh, it. just seems so it, impossible to, to create a government system that would be able to withstand all the different ways that uh, the different things that, that humans can do and the, the ways we can get at each other's throats. But uh, yeah. Well, there's a couple of key, you know, we think of them as guardrails and guardrails are, you know, where politics is, you know, people getting into noisy, dangerous vehicles called political parties and elections and careening around the track and the guardrails are essential. One of them is, you know, a system for organizing elections and administering them that people can agree on and which people have confidence in and which people say, okay, we may disagree fundamentally on this or that policy, but we've had an election and we respect the results. So one is an election administration system that works. And the other, just as important or in a way more important, is is the rule of law in which we, we, we agree that law is above politics and that politicians have to respect the law and what the law says is what everybody has to do. And so when politics becomes so divisive that those two guardrails get attacked and people start attacking the guardrails rather than just fighting for policy when they fight against an election system, when they fight against the rule of law and try to override it and question the objectivity of judges and so forth, then you have a serious problem on your hands. And that's why it feels like in the United States in the last couple of years, you know, uh, a yellow light starts looking like it's flashing red in terms of our democratic health because we've had a president who instinctively goes after the guardrails. He doesn't just go after the opponents. He goes after the guardrails. And that's what we've been living through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To make a poker analogy, it'd be like trying to play poker and instead of just trying to win hands like normal, you would be trying to question the entire rules of the game and saying the people enforcing the rules are, are unjust and you should win because the rules are unfair. And yeah, it's a whole questioning the whole meta structure of, of things is a whole nother level of, uh, of, of damage. You know? How do you see the role of the internet and social media and maybe other modern technologies like many television channels playing a role in, in polarization issues? Look, you know, a lot of people sort of say, God, this is all social media's fault. If we didn't have the social media, we wouldn't be so fragmented. We wouldn't be sort of given to extremes. And I think it's certainly the case that social media has been an accelerator of a lot of changes in the last five to 10 years. And it, it does make it easier to move into those information bubbles. It does tend to propagate extreme views and so forth. But the polarization that we're facing in the United States is not the result of social media. It goes back to very deep roots in our country uh, around a lot of fairly profound issues, like, as I mentioned, the role of the federal government in sociopolitical life and other things. And so Blaming technology for our sociopolitical ills is a kind of an escapist tendency that we should avoid. It doesn't mean we shouldn't think hard about whether technology, uh, social media, or other forms of you know, digital communication need to be regulated in certain ways differently than we're currently doing. But there's not going to be a technological solution to polarization. It's, it's a much deeper human condition. Hmm. So one thing I've been thinking about in regards to these polarization issues is that Maybe there's some inherent process that happens with economically successful societies that they basically contain the seeds of their own demise in the sense that as people have more free time and more awareness of the events and people around them, that there's more and more ways to look at the injustice around us or the fact that people are unequal in various ways, that leaders are flawed, that the illusions of patriotism and camaraderie start to break down the more you examine the the concepts of a nation. And I'm wondering if you if you see this as being these things as being some sort of fundamental process, whether you look at Rome falling apart or whether you look at modern nations, is is there some kind of inherent cycle at work here? Or do you think I'm just extrapolating in, in weird ways? Well, yeah, a little weird. Uh, I, I can't quite go with you on this because 
you're sort of saying there's a, it's like there's this beautiful flower and its beauty contains within it sort of the end of it. So you can sort of see the flower is going to pass from this beautiful blossom to a, you know, a rotting uh, deadhead. And I don't think that's how societies evolve. When I look at uh, some of the countries in the world that are most successful in terms of delivering human development, like the Scandinavian countries, for example, I don't see societies that are rotting. I see actually them doing great. Um, in terms of delivering human development and relatively high levels of satisfaction with the government and so forth. I think, you know, sort of saying, wow, the United States seems to be going through some hard times, and maybe it's because that's sort of a natural evolution of our success. It's more because of our failings. If we were governed better and we were delivering more for the uh, middle class and for lower classes in this country, people wouldn't be as unhappy, wouldn't be as divisive. And if we had institutions that were better developed, I think, that were stronger and more resilient, like our healthcare system and other things, people would be better off and would be happier. And so I think it's more our failings that are dogging us rather than our successes. And so I, I wouldn't go with you there. You know, there's... I look at Germany. I, I spend time there for my work, and I work with a number of German institutions. It's a very well-governed society that is handling the stresses of a globalized world, and these days a deglobalizing world, pretty well. And you know, good governance is actually uh, uh, a nice thing to live in for many Germans. And so, so I, I be careful with the direction of your thoughts. I think the Roman Empire analogy is is different because that's about empire overstretch or overreach, which some empires tend to do. And then they overreach and try to maintain control over too many things that they're not capable of. That's a different problem than whether or not kind of mature governance systems are sustainable or not. Yeah, I guess the, uh, and that's good to hear because it's a positive view. And some of the things I've been reading lately about the need for chaos worldviews, they basically have this perception that, uh, or this viewpoint that things need to be, society needs to be burned down and destroyed in order to get better. And there was a surprisingly high number of people that had those kind of views. And it seemed like that was, those kinds of views were on the rise. And so I might be affected by reading some of those things. And we have so much focus these days on the bad mm -hmm. things. So it, it's possible to maybe, you know, see monsters under the bed in, in, in some sense for these things. Um, so yeah, I think we're we're at a good stopping point. Oh, one random question I wanted to ask you while I had you here. I had read this book called Disinformation, and it was by a former Romanian spy chief who worked for the Russians and who had defected to the U.S. Do you happen to know that book? Disinformation. Yeah, it's by a, uh, a general pa Pachipa or something. Pachepa? Pachepa, Pachepa. yeah. Yeah, yeah and, I do know. Do you, is that a respected book? Because he detailed a lot of you know plots, disinformation plots from the Russians throughout the last 100 years. And I, I hadn't been able to determine if that was a respected book or if... Yeah, he's a serious person. But okay. yeah, he was a defector, a high-level defector from the Ceausescu regime who wrote some sort of lurid accounts of things he knew. Some of it's probably exaggerated, but... Another book that's better researched, or well, not re his book wasn't researched; it was personal experience. So a book that is more of an analytic account is David Scheimer, I think it's S H I M E R, uh, account of both U.S. and Russian electoral meddling in the 20th century, where he has a lot of accounts of what Russia, the Soviet Union, tried to do in the United States and other Western countries in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It's fascinating. I really enjoyed reading about. The disinformation efforts they had carried out. And I would. I, it was based on interviews he did with a number of senior former Soviet um, intelligence officials and others, as well as some of the U.S. efforts in other countries. So I would recommend that book. If you had to give one or two tips for what regular everyday citizens could do to fight extreme or unreasonable polarization, do you have any tips like that? Well, I think all of us you know, need to take a deep breath and say that our system is more important than any particular goal. We've got to preserve our system. We have to respect the rule of law, and we need to respect sort of underlying principles of moderation and tolerance uh, for each other. And we need to be careful not to fall into the trap of misunderstanding those who are on the other side. You know, really good research like that done by the More in Common group shows that people on either side of the partisan divide in the United States systematically misunderstand the other side. 
And so, you know, strong conservatives asked about progressives have views of them that are really just out of touch with reality and vice versa. Uh, strong progressives have views of conservatives that are just out of touch with reality. And so this systematic misunderstanding needs to be overcome and individuals need to sort of not fall into the trap of assuming the worst about the other side. doesn't mean they have to assume the best, but at least try to be somewhat neutral and say, am I really operating here from emotion or from reason? And so, you know, that's another thing. And then finally, you know, beyond that is, is, you know, trying to create some bridges across this line, trying to look in small ways to say, you know, are there ways I can reach across the line? In my case, for example, I try regularly during a week to check in on some websites that uh, represent views I, <laughs> I just don't agree with. But I like to try to understand what they're thinking and why. And it doesn't hurt, you know, to spend a half hour reading a website that you just think, oh, I don't agree with this. I really don't agree with this. But just sort of force yourself, choose a good one. I wouldn't go all the way to the fringe. but uh, you know, to choose one that's respectable and there are plenty on both sides and read it and think a little bit and open your mind up and challenge yourself to try to understand what's going on uh, in people's minds whom you, you don't know well or you may think you know, but you don't really know well. Thanks a lot for talking to me. This has been Thomas Carruthers. Thanks a lot for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave me a rating or review on iTunes or whatever platform you listen on, or share it with friends on social media. I make no money on this podcast, and it takes me a good amount of time to produce, so all shares and reviews are most appreciated. If you'd like to donate money to encourage me to do more interviews, I have a Patreon account at patreon.com slash Zach Elwood, Z-A-C-H. You can find podcast episode summaries at my website, readingpokertells.video. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. <laughs>